and I call on Ivan McKee to speak to and move the motion. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak this afternoon about space and the importance of the space sector in Scotland to our economy and the focus that the Scottish Government places on the development of the sector. And these are indeed exciting times for the space industry in Scotland. Um, the sector's rapid growth globally offers huge opportunities which Scotland is well placed to take advantage of. Scotland already has, as we know, an innovative and diverse engineering base with world-class companies competing in international markets. We have excellence in data science and data application, and we're already punching above our weight in the space sector. We're in a great place to consolidate on these existing strengths. Over two years, we've seen a 27% increase in the number of space organisations in Scotland to over 130, with a total income of £140 million. This includes the headquarters of 83 UK space industry firms. Nearly a fifth of all UK space jobs are in Scotland, more than double our population share. On your way into the Parliament building today, you may have seen the Black Arrow rocket parked outside. And if you haven't, I recommend you go and have a look. Black Arrow's third flight was the first and only successful UK-led orbital launch. It placed the Prospero satellite into orbit from a launch site in Australia in 1971, the only British satellite to be put into orbit using a British launch vehicle. Pros Prospero is still in orbit, although no longer in communication with planet Earth. Some may say that's a characteristic it perhaps shares with some of those currently responsible for the future of UK's place in Europe. I couldn't possibly comment. At a time when Scotland aims to be the first place in Europe capable of launching small satellites into orbit, it seems fitting that Black Arrow is now here in Edinburgh. And I congratulate Skyrora, one of Scotland's rocket manufacturing businesses, on successfully bringing it back. When we talk of space, we may think of the massive rocket launches at Cape Canaveral, but the modern space industry comprises much more than space rockets, exciting though that is. We have opportunities in upstream space manufacturing and in space operations, including small satellite manufacture, and opportunities for companies dealing with downstream space data and space data and applications. Looking ahead, there are other longer term potential opportunities emerging, such as energy provision through solar panels in space, asteroid prospecting for minerals, together with associated supporting habitat facilities and low gravity manufacturing in space. Not so long ago, this would all have been considered science fiction, but is rapidly becoming science fact. Scotland is proud to be the home of Agile Space, a versatile and adaptable sector with close collaboration between government, industry and academia. Our culture of open innovation and collaboration is essential for our continuing success. We have a supportive business environment with the developing National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland, real academic strengths, a range of practical support and advice available via our enterprise agencies and a strong partnership with the sector through the industry-led Scottish Space Leadership Council. NMIST will be an industry-led international centre of expertise in manufacturing, which will make Scotland a global leader with academia, industry and the public sector working together to transform manufacturing skills, productivity and innovation right across Scotland. Our excellent higher education sector is at the forefront of this technology. Glasgow, Strathclyde, Edinburgh and Dundee universities, all of major strengths in the space sector. Edinburgh's Higgs Centre for Innovation, built on the site of the Royal Observatory, is a business incubation centre, as well as providing space test and development facilities. I was at the centre earlier this year and thoroughly recommend a visit. Scotland is very much open for business and our enterprise agencies will continue to work with any company with a viable proposal seeking to develop a future in our increasingly successful space sector. Scotland is already a world leader in small satellite manufacture and we have businesses who analyse and use the valuable data beamed back from orbit. The missing link is the ability to launch satellites. Scotland is the best place in the UK to reach in-demand orbits with vertical rockets and there's a real opportunity to capture a share of the growing market for launching an estimated 2,000 small satellites by 2030. With the city of Glasgow building more small satellites than any place in Europe, affordable and efficient access to space is key to growing our fast developing small satellite industry. 
Clyde space is recognised as a world-class innovator and supplier of small satellite systems. Spire Global, the first company in the UK and Europe to provide an end-to-end -end CubeSat development and data service offering. And Alba Orbital, who are building and launching some of the world's most advanced Pico satellites for Earth observation and telecoms purposes, also based in Glasgow. Our ambition is to have at least one spaceport within Scotland. Having satellite launch facilities will help us to deliver strong economic benefits and is expected to open up a wide range of market opportunities in Scotland. With launch capability, we will then be able to build, launch and operate satellites all from Scotland, supporting the ambition to grow the sector here into a £4 billion industry by 2030. The UK Space Agency's decision to support the development of Space Hub Sutherland is key to meeting these aspirations. Although that is not the only space port consideration uh, in play, as people will well understand. A total funding package of 17.3 million will be invested in the site. Highlands and Islands Enterprise are working hard to deliver on this ambition in partnership with Lockheed Martin Space Systems and with Orbex. And as the market for small satellites continues to grow, so will the demand for launch facilities, with sites in the Western Isles, the Shetland Islands and at Presswick all interested in developing space-related launch activities. Just on Friday, my colleague, the Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Infrastructure and Connectivity, signed the heads of terms for the Ayrshire Growth Deal. This includes support for the Aerospace and Space Programme that will benefit from up to £30 million of Scottish Government investment with partners up to £80 million in total uh, investment. The aerospace and space sector employs over 4,000 people in Ayrshire and we have ambitious plans to help double that. Indeed. David Stewart. I asked the Minister his assessment, and thanks Minister for giving away, his assessment of Mark Rahanish uh, airstrip in Campbelltown. The Minister will know that I think during the Second World War it was the largest airstrip in Europe and it's got great facilities. What assessment has the Scottish Government made of this? Minister. Uh, as I said in uh, earlier in my speech, the Scottish Government and our agencies are very keen to hear from any um, business or opportunity to uh, benefit the, and help grow and further develop the Scottish space sector. So I'd be very interested in exploring that discussion further. I know work has been done across that, considering a range of, uh, of uh, opportunities for launch sites, and I believe that was one of the ones that has been included in earlier reports. Um, but I'm very willing to talk to the, the member about that, uh, about that separately. And going back to Ayrshire, um, the, uh, the, 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 as I said, there's more than 4,000 people in Ayrshire in the space sector, in aerospace sector, and we have ambitious plans to double that. Investment secured through the Ayrshire Growth Deal will deliver space for infrastructure to support the ambition of establishing a horizontal launch facility at Presswick Airport, including commercial space and transport infrastructure. It will also support the creation of an aerospace and space innovation centre, which will be a central hub to encourage growth supporting aerospace and space businesses in Scotland and the UK. Developing launch facilities opens the door to a whole range of new business opportunities. Already we have Orbex opening its new rocket manufacturing facilities in Forres, and I was delighted to be there at the formal opening of their launch vehicle development and manufacturing facility last month to hear about their plans to employ around 150 people on the site and to see the prime rocket itself an impressive piece of engineering with a carbon fibre structure, a 3D printed engine and running on low emission fuel. And other rocket um, and research and manufacturing businesses are already based in Scotland, including Skyrora, who I mentioned earlier, um, who, who for, for, and thank them for bringing the Black Arrow back to Scotland. The Sp Shetland Space Centre is also developing proposals for ground station satellite tracking facilities, and which could also support launch facilities. And Scotland is the data-driven capital of Europe, as we know, hosting the largest centre for informatics in Europe and having more than 170 data science companies. The downstream use of space data is supporting a diverse and growing range of services, including BirdEye, based in Glasgow, using space-derived intelligence to monitor global construction. Trade in Space, also in Glasgow, developing new financial services with data collected by satellites, making peer-to-peer -peer trading fairer and easier. Econometrica, GSI and Carbomart, all based in Edinburgh, and others are monitoring the Earth's forests and crops and tracking the impact of climate change. Astrostat, based in Musselburgh, helping people understand the planet while aiding disaster response. And SOXA, the Scottish Centre for Excellence 
and satellite applications based at Strathclyde University, helping develop smart, connected fish farms. But there are still challenges ahead, as with every sector the industry is concerned about the potential impact of the UK's exit from the EU. Companies are particularly concerned about the potential for a research funding gap to emerge. Any agreement with the EU on science and innovation will need to reflect the priorities and strengths across the whole of the UK, including Scotland, and we fully expect the UK government to engage effectively with us on that. And it's a challenge, a challenge for our ambition to start launch uh, of uh, small satellites in 2021 is the need for launch operating companies and launch sites to have operating licenses. The UK government has said that the required secondary legislation should be in place by the end of 2021 and has confirmed that any site that uh, can meet the safety and regulatory aspects of space flight would be eligible to apply for a license to establish a spaceport. Our ambitious plans for the space sector need strong leadership to succeed. Political leadership, public sector leadership and business leadership. We are working in partnership with the Scottish Space Leadership Council, which includes representatives from all parts of the space sector, from potential launch sites, satellite manufacturers, businesses engaged in data analysis and academic partners. Together, we will deliver the aspiration to grow the Scottish space sector into a £4 billion industry by 2030. And we will seize the opportunity to make Scotland the, the leading uh, Europe, uh, space nation in Europe. Presiding officer, I move my, the motion in my name and I'd just like to comment on the amendments. We will be supporting, uh, the government will be supporting the Conservative and Labour amendments. We will not be uh, uh, supporting the Lib Dem amendments, uh, not because we're opposed to enterprise zones or their application in this sector, but we are awaiting a review from Scottish Enterprise into their effectiveness, which will inform our future decision. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. And can I call on Edward Mountain to speak to move the amendment in his name? Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and the Scottish Conservatives welcome today's debate on the Scottish space sector. We believe Scotland's in a unique position to become Europe's leading commercial space nation, and grasping this opportunity should, I believe, unite all MSPs across this chamber. The Scottish Conservatives welcome the funding from the UK Government that is boosting Scotland's space industry and ensuring that Scotland is a world leader in research and development. We also support the partnership of Highlands and Islands Enterprise and the UK Space Agency in delivering the first spaceport in the UK. As our Highlands and Islands MSP, I'm delighted that Sutherland will lead the way in the UK's face, first spaceport. I'm also delighted to be opening for my party today because it means that I'll be able to make the case for Sutherland before John Scott makes the case for Presswick. And Tavish Scott builds on the article he wrote for the papers today about the suitability of Shetland. But we are under no illusions. All the sites have merits, and all the sites can deliver for Scotland. So joking aside, the simple truth is I believe that every MSP would like to see their constituency, or indeed region, reap the benefits of the space industry uh, and what, all that it offers. And I firmly believe that every region, as I have said, has something to offer, and this should be celebrated by everyone. My initial uh, position to support uh, Highlands and Islands, uh, and, and therefore brings me into conflict of who to support, whether it should be the spaceport in Sutherland or Tavish's re uh, Scott's recommendation about Shetland. But I don't believe it should be either or, because I think there are opportunities not only for vertical spaceports that we've heard about, but also the horizontal ones that I'm sure that we will hear, hear about. But we're not in Scotland just capable of launching rockets, although we can build them too. In fact, Scotland builds more spacecraft than anywhere else outside California, and that's something to be proud of. It's a remarkable success story for Scottish manufacturing. And Scotland, I believe, is leading the European space race because not only can we design and build and operate, but we will now be able to launch spacecraft. And I believe that the UK has the right business environment, the right industrial capability, and also blessed to have the right geography to succeed. As my amendment sets out, it is important to recognise that this success is underpinned by a UK government which is making the right choices in supporting the space industry. Firstly, the UK Government Space Industry Act 2018 
allows for commercial operators to launch flights into orbit with payloads such as satellites or scientific experiments. Secondly, the UK government's industrial strategy includes support for a £50 million programme known as Launch UK to support small satellite launches and suborbital flights. Taken together, the Space Industry Act and the UK industrial strategy make Scotland the best place in Europe to start and grow a space business. And the economic potential is huge, as we have heard. And I want to mention that a bit more. S commercial small-scale satellite, satellite launches could be worth up to £44 billion to the UK economy over the next decade and contribute to the UK government's aim to grow our share of the global market to 10% by 2030. Choosing Sutherland as Scotland's first uh, spaceport must be just the start. Um, and I'll excuse the puns, there are just but two in this speech. While this might be just one small step for the launch of the UK programme, it could be a giant leap for the Highlands economy. Now, Lockheed Martin and Orbex have already signed memorandums of understandings to use the launch site, and it is anticipated that there could be up to six launches per year. And it's expected that the Sutherland Spaceport will create about 40 highly skilled jobs in the area, and HIE estimates that that figure could multiply to 400 jobs by 2023. That is a really positive impact, which will spread across a wider region too. We've already seen Orbex looking to base their mission control and design hub in Forres in Murray. That is important. Overall, this crucial investment in Sutherland and across the Highlands could, could not come at a better time for the region. There is a real need, I believe, for high-skilled STEM jobs in the area and the growth of the space industry has the potential to soften the negative impact of Dune Ray being de decommissioned. And this brings me to my final point. It's vital that the investment in the space industry is made to work for local communities. It's fair to say that the plans for Sutherland Spaceport have divided opinion in the communities of Melness and Tongue. I believe that the appropriate channel to support or oppose the development is through the local planning system. And I've always been clear that I strongly believe that planning system should decide locally on the decisions and that should be honoured by the government. And I believe that the communities will see the benefit because the space industry is a lucrative business. But, and the growth of this industry, I believe, could work for local communities, not only in the Highlands, but also across Scotland. Presiding officer, and I excuse my second pun now comes to now, is to infinity and beyond. That is the prize which is within touching distance, I believe, for Scotland and the rest of the United Kingdom. We are leading the way in cutting edge commercial space technology, and the opportunity is there to launch an estimated 2,000 satellites by 2030. By making the right choices now, we're giving Scottish businesses a head start in the European space race. Now, I'd like to say at the outset that we as a party are looking to support the Labour amendment, but we are also slightly concerned about the Liberal Democrats amendment, and we look forward to ex the explanation of these enterprise zones being fully explained during this debate. Presiding officer, Scotland is well placed in this space race, and I believe it's a, a race that we can win, and I do hope that all across this chamber will join me in supporting it and I move the amendment in my name. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on David Stewart to speak to move the motion, amendment in his name. Uh, thank you, uh, President Officer, and I warmly welcome the Scottish Government's initiative to debate the Scottish space sector and with perfect timing, appearing during Science Week. I'm sure that was well planned, uh, Minister. Uh, Labour will be supporting the motion in the name of Ivan McKee. Uh, on the 9th of July 1962, uh, a Thor Delta rocket uh, was launched from Cape Canaveral and on board was the United Kingdom's Aerial One satellite, which not only made the UK the third country after the USA and the old Soviet Union to operate a satellite, but launched the UK's space industry. Now that industry has developed a point of which in 2014, it contributed 11.8 billion to the British economy and supported 35,000 jobs according to the UK government figures. And just as it was a satellite 
that began the UK space industry. So as the satellites will allow the UK government to secure its ambition of a space industry that will be worth, as we've heard, 40 billion by 2030, which will represent 10% share of the global space industry market. A first step towards that goal was the UK government's announcement that it tended to develop a single site as the UK spaceport. And in July 2014, a short list of potential sites was announced with a view the chosen site will be up and running by 2018. The original shortlist of eight was reduced to five, which included three sites in Scotland, in Prestwick, Campbelltown, and in the Western Isles. And in May 2016, the Department of Transport wrote to the spaceport bidders to inform of their decision to end the bidding process and to move towards a licensing model. Now, President Officer, in previous debates, I have supported the case uh, for the selection of Campbelltown Airport for a horizontal takeoff spaceport, but also recognised the great strengths of the other locations in Prestwick, in Shetland, and in Western Isles, and in Sutherland. And in the intervening three years since my original uh, members' debate on spaceports, there's been substantial developments. For example, the UK Space Agency, the UKSA, announced financial support last summer for a high-back scheme to launch satellites within the Melnus Crofters Estate in Sutherland. Now, the Board of High, as we've heard, have approved £17.3 to support the project. That includes UKSA's £2.5 million, High's nearly £10 million, and £5 million has been sought from the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority. But, of course, the High Board approval depends on the identification and delivery of local community benefits. But the Space Hub Sutherland would be vertical takeoff, and, as we've heard, would aim for six launches annually, the first in 2010. Uh, High Director David Oxley stated the job's target is 400, with the aim to send 2,000 small satellites into orbit by 2030. Uh, as the Minister said earlier, um, uh, startup firm Orbex have already opened a base in Forest with the promise of 40 jobs this year and plans to expand up to 150. Uh, but Professor uh, Malcolm McLeod, the Director of the Scottish Centre for Excellence in Satellite Applications and a UKSA board member, said, and I quote, President Officer, we build more spacecraft than anywhere outside California. We have more frequent access to space than anywhere in the world, and we're almost certainly going to have the first spaceport in Europe. So effectively, there's a gap in the market. In Scotland, we design, build, and operate spacecraft. We can exploit the data that comes from them. The gap is the ability to launch. A spaceport would solve that problem. And Lockheed Martin, speaking at the last CPG in Aviation, uh, which I chaired, uh, raised a few key issues for the future. First of all, will the UK government provide a liability cap for launch activities? And this may be clearer from the publication of the secondary legislation linked to the 2018 Space Industry Act. The other key issue is the commercial viability of the first European small satellite launch on demand service. There is intense competition across Europe, and it's crucial the UK gets there first. The prize is immense. Now, Oxford Economics carried out an economic impact assessment for the UK satellite launch capability. They said it would uh, add 2.5 billion to GDP, sustain 375 jobs, but the largest gross value added at 63% will be in Scotland, as we will house the launch site. Now, Scotland in general, and Highlands and Islands in particular, have, of course, a comparative advantage in terms of location. It provides access to sun, uh, to sun synchrotous and polar orbits, which are effectively low-altitude orbits, which are both well-suited to a wide range of commercial and other satellite applications. In my view, President Officer, it's vital that Scotland does not miss this important opportunity. Throughout history, Scottish scientists and engineers have been in the vanguard of innovation and discovery. From James Watt, the godfather of the Industrial Revolution, to Robert Watson Watt, the inventor of radar, from Wilmina Fleming, an early astrophysics pioneer, to James Clark Maxwell, who worked out the composition of Saturn's rings over 120 years before a space probe studied them. Space technology can offer economic, strategic, and inspirational gains. And as the writer Arthur C. Clarke said, the inspirational value of the space program is probably of far more importance to education than any input of dollars. A whole generation is growing up which has been attracted to the hard disciplines of science and engineering by the romance of space. We owe it not just to people today to get behind this project, but to those yet unborn. We can build up this great legacy and grasp this opportunity to be the forefront of space technology, or we can choose to be left behind. Space technology offers a new frontier for Scotland. Now we just need to boldly go and deliver it. 
I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much. Uh, I now call on Tavi Scott to speak to move amendment 1631. 2.1, Mr Scott. Thank, Thank you very you. much, uh, Presiding Officer. The space race is indeed on. Scotland as a location versus European and worldwide alternatives. It's not just about uh, whether Scotland can be uh, the location. The important thing to recognise in there, as I'm sure Mr Stewart does, is that Andoya in Norway, the Swedish government and the Portuguese Azores are all competing to be the first launch vertical site across Europe. Uh, launching small satellites can happen here, but launch will depend on being first to market uh, the market stress is the important aspect of this industry, who will invest £1 billion uh, per year uh, every year in the coming decades. Uh, that is why the Shetland Space Centre, Shetland Lands Council and our industry partners will deliver a ground and data centre in UNS this year and a launch facility for small-scale satellite markets by 2020. As a director of a company, it is an incredibly exciting project, a project de developed by private sector investment. Shetland understands what industry needs and when. We've been doing that with oil and gas for the last 40 years. UNST in particular deserves economic support and a vibrant future. Shell flew fixed wing and helicopter oil transfers from Baltic Sound Airfield to the East Shetland Basin until the late 1990s. In 2006, NATO closed down their Saxaford radar. Uh, those decisions halved UNST's population and was a huge blow to the island's economic future at that time. I want to reverse that, as does our council, as do our partners, and nothing will stop that objective, and that includes Highlands Islands Enterprise and Inverness. Uh, High authored the SEPTA report. It is an authoritative assessment of the small-scale satellite space market and where a UK launch site should be situated. This report established that the best location for vertical launch in the UK is Unst, because it is the furthest and most northerly point. Yet High, for reasons I don't understand, refused to publish that report. Shetland obtained that report not from the Economic Development Agency of the Highlands and Islands, but from the UK Space Agency. High have not been working to help Shetland on launch ever since, and I don't understand why. Uh, High should adopt a fair approach of encouraging all options, as the Minister and Mr Stewart rightly said. Ministers should adopt a level playing field on launch sites to ensure Scotland delivers against this European competition. And that's what, to answer Mr Mountain's question, is behind my amendment. All areas of space activity need government to support to compete, not with each other, but with the worldwide market that exists. Enterprise areas could be established to bring in business. That would be a signal that government is taking an even-handed approach to the market and supporting all of Scotland. I hope the Minister would accept that logic in his closing remarks, and the Tories might accept that too. Unst is the right location for space. Why? Because a rocket blasting uh, off from Unst crosses only sea, not west of Shetland oil fields and installations or the Faroese Island or the Faroe Islands. And un sure. Gil Ross. I thank taken the intervention. Um, I also have a copy of the SEPTA report and although it does say that the Shetland Isles is the best location to launch from as the trajectory as he said um, avoids the populations in the Faroes and Iceland, it does however say that a ro remote island location would be more logistically challenging than a mainland site such as the Moyne Peninsula and therefore that's why that was chosen to be supported. Mr Scott, I'll give you your time back. Gail Ross might um, accept that if that argument was followed, we'd have never built the Stolen Boyle oil terminal, we'd have never built the Total uh, gas plant, which has just been built with $4 billion of uh, finance. We wouldn't have engineering companies like Summerjay and so many others who've been based in Shetland for the last 40 years. So uh, I understand High running down Shetland and, and uh, arguing that they have, and the way in which they have been, that uh, we can't do things in Shetland, we don't have engineering companies, and we haven't had oil and gas for 40 years. The evidence is rather to the contrary of that. As uh, an UNCH launch directly reaches polar and sun synchronous ob orbits, as David Stewart rightly says, and that's what industry uh, needs. UNCH does it directly. No other site does that. The parallels with oil and gas are resonant. When the vast East Shetland Basin, basin was discovered in the 1970s, the industry needed the nearest point of land for a terminal. That became Sulem Vo. Once again, with space, industry, not public agencies, will choose their preferred location. That is why Ariane, the European space monolith, is partnering with Shetland to design and build the launch facility. I am grateful 
to the First Minister for her discussion with our partners in Ariane when she recently met the company in Paris, as they explained to the First Minister, Unst is the best location in Northern Europe. It is why commercial satellite businesses across Scotland of the kind that the Minister and others have described have been to Unst and want to launch from Unst. It's why Gunhilly in Cornwall, a UK Earth Observation Centre, will partner with Shetland. Their Chief Executive says it is obvious that Shetland is recognised as the best location by key launch companies. And it is why the policy of the UK Government and their regulator, the UK Space Agency, uh, all support launch options right across the, the UK. Be in no doubt, presiding officer, Unst will be the centre of this exciting new industrial future, and for Mr Mountain, it will be the final frontier. Uh, please move... Oh dear. And I'll move the amendment. Please move your amendment. I don't think to take any more of these satellite and astronomical quotes, but I suppose I'm going to get more. Um, I now call Claire Adamson to be followed by John Scott. Four-minute speeches in the open debate. I beg your pardon, something I've done wrong. I beg you. I'm sorry, you jumped the gun. I didn't get it I wrong. I beg your pardon, my fault. That's, oh, it's such a change. Uh, <laughs> I, call, I call Claire Adamson and then the former Deputy Presiding Officer, George <laughs> Scott, who should know better. Thank you, Miss Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And uh, I, I declare an interest and I will not be arguing for the spaceport to come to my constituency this afternoon, although I do say that Mother Militia has a great tradition of engineering and science and a wonderful college, and I would welcome any of the new businesses in this area to come to uh, investigate that in Mother Militia. Last week, I was delighted to attend the Celebrating EU Researchers Nice, hosted here um, by Lewis MacDonald. Um, I certainly hope it will not be the last time that we're able to celebrate Horizon 2020 projects in this area. Um, it was um, Explorathon who were there, um, seven of our world-class universities showing off some of the work that they are doing and funded by the European Commission. Um, the, it includes the University of Strathclyde and I was delighted to meet with Peter McGinty, Network Manager for the Stardust Project. Uh, it's a project involving asteroids and space debris and it's devoted to mastering the techniques required to monitor asteroids and space debris, manage the removal and deflection of these and explore the possible benefits from being able to exploit these as a resource in the future. The Stardust Consortium is a collaboration of universities from across the EU and private investors who are seeking to ensure an ethical approach to space exploration that embraces reusability, reusable components, uh, and, and a manufacturing that will limit debris in space and allows to limit the potential risks of both asteroids and man-made space debris. And it was a fantastic project to see. Um, and if we want um, a, a timely reminder of what space debris looks like, we've got the Black Arrow R3 outside, presiding officer. Um, uh, can I thank you for working with Sky Rora to bring that to the parliament today? And um, they were telling me you're affectionately now known as the Rocket Lady. I might pay for that later on. <laughs> it really is. Um, Stardust is a truly visionary project exemplifying the potential for Scotland and our universities to lead in this new industry. In 2016, the OECD Directorate for Science and Technology and Innovation produced a policy note, Space and Innovation, How Do Space Activities Relate to the Global Economy? And the note states that the three overarching thrusts that are driving innovation in the space sector up until 2026 are the persistence of national security and science objectives with ever more countries investing in space programs, the expansion of downstream space applications and the pursuit of human space exploration. Not surprisingly then that government funding is key to this sector but disappointingly at that time the UK had one of the lowest percentage shares of GDP being spent in this sector, just 0.05% of the research um, budget in comparison to 0.1% for France, double what the UK were doing at that time. Um, since then, the British Business Enterprise Research Development statistics show that Scotland is investing in R&D in this area. Investment that is reaching um, uh, particularly impressive, over 1.2 billion was spent in R&D businesses in Scotland last year. It's a sizable 13.9 increase in real terms uh, from 2016 and a 93.6% increase when compared to 20, 
2007 levels. The bird expenditure in Scotland was 1.247 billion, the highest level since 2001, and the UK expenditure increased by 2.9 percent in real terms in this period as I compared to 13.9 percent for Scotland so um, it is an area that we can lead in we can boldly go on to be world leaders in this it, space is the final frontier and whether it's space debris or landing comets um, feely on comet 67p Scotland can lead the way thank you thank you very much I call John Scott to be followed by Kenneth Gibson Mr Scott please thank you Deputy Presiding Officer and may I begin by saying what a pleasure it is to take part in this debate about Scotland becoming Europe's leading space nation. Can I also say it's a pleasure to do so following the signing last week of the Ayrshire Growth Deal at the Ayrshire College when £80 million was allocated to aerospace and the space programme, with £32 million being allocated by the UK Government, £30 million being allocated by the Scottish Government and £18 million being added to the total by South Ayrshire Council. And can I say thank you in my old-fashioned way to each of these agencies of government for this massive level of support. Because presiding officer, Presbyterian Airport with 880 acres of land and its unique natural and geographical attributes has a bright future and enormous potential. Of still greater importance to Ayrshire and particularly South Ayrshire is the almost 4,000 largely MRO jobs uh, supported by the aerospace sector in and around the airport. And this concept of a spaceport at Presswick would build on and from this solid foundation. Companies such as Spirit, employing over a thousand people, build 65 leading edge wings per month for Airbus, are involved in pioneering the use of composite materials. BE Systems design the airplanes of the future and are involved in helping to develop a new horizontal launch reusable spacecraft, while companies such as Chevron are seeking more hangar space to refurbish aircraft from many of the world's major airlines. Ryanair, UTC, Woodward, G Caledonian, between them support over a thousand jobs. With 800 jobs at Nats, there is a genuinely world-class hub of expertise in and around Prestwick. So, presiding officer, Prestwick seeks to be part of the growing small satellite space industry, which is expected to be worth 3.8 billion to the UK by 2030, as Ivan McKee has already said because Prestwick is the location of choice in the United Kingdom for horizontal launch spacecraft with cleared airspace all the way to the North Pole. And that is why the allocation of £80 million to Prestwick Airport last week is so important, as it and other funds available will allow the airport to make the necessary modest infrastructure improvements to make horizontal launch possible from this site and in particular gain the necessary CAA certification as well as host the Scottish Space and Innovation Centre. Of course, Scottish Conservatives welcome the vertical launch site to be built in Sutherland, but the big prize in this field will go to those using reusable horizontal launch vehicles at a location supported by excellent road and rail infrastructure as well as can-do companies which can design, build and repair anything that flies. Cleared airspace to the North Pole is another vital asset of the Presswick site and one of the local companies very much involved in this new space race is Orbital Access, led by Stuart McIntyre, grandson of Group Captain McIntyre, one of the founders of the airport in 1935. In addition, presiding officer, Glasgow, Strathclyde and the University of the West of Scotland are all involved in the development of spaceport and they also support Clyde Space and other Glasgow builders of small satellites. And I congratulate these hugely successful pioneers and market leaders in the development of small satellites in the west of Scotland. So, presiding officer, horizontal satellite space launch may be just around the corner at Presswick, where it is hoped that the operational model and business case for horizontal launch will be in place by October this year. When that happens, the world will once again take note of what Presswick can deliver and it is my hope that this type of cutting-edge industry, along with the others already on site, will attract further investors to Presswick and Ayrshire. Presiding officer, the Ayrshire growth deal has come at exactly the right time for the development of Presswick, and it is an opportunity to be seized with both hands, as I am certain it will be, with both governments, three councils, three universities, and the Ayrshire Co College, as well as the people of Ayrshire, all working together in a collaborative way to make this a success. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I call Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Mr Gibson. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. As a 13-year-old, my friend Colin and I would catch the bus into Glasgow City Centre and visit the old spit and sawdust Bay Horse pub. Over a Coca-Cola, we watched the original, the only to my mind, Star Trek, our mother's addiction to Coronation Street denying us the chance to see such a magnificent programme at home in an era before catch-up, DVD and even video, although I know that for you, presiding officer, it was the invention of the talkies that changed your world. Anyway, while watching fleshy, flashy Captain Kirk, Mr Spock, Bones and the gang, we escaped the reality of the Cold War and a hot conflict in Vietnam, travelling to a future three centuries hence, where Captain Kirk always got the girl and the nations of the earth had set aside their differences, abolished poverty, racism and conflict to create a multi-ethnic, indeed multi-species United Federation of Planets, exploring the universe with astonishingly advanced technology. In the mid-70s, Apollo was winding down. However, we looked forward to humanity landing on Mars by 1985, moon bases by 1999, and our species fulfilling its destiny and reaching for the stars long before now. But sadly, you can't change the laws of physics, as Scotty Chief Engineer of the Starship Enterprise said, and the invention of warp drive moving faster than the speed of light still eludes us. So I take my hat off to those space pioneers who still look upwards and see humanity reaching beyond the confines of our beautiful planet. Today we had a wee glimpse of our current involvement in space with Skyrora bringing the Black Arrow to Parliament and I thank you uh, for that, Presiding Officer. Back in October 2016, I strongly argued for Presswick to be the UK's first spaceport. Since then, Presswick has worked with partners to make a horizontal space launch from there a reality, moving towards a licence application. With one of the longest runways in the UK, over 2,880 metres, that frequently handles the largest aircraft. Already a NASA partner, Presswick has hygiene, health check and rehabilitation facilities for, an astro for astronauts returning from space via Kazakhstan. With the space industry set for rapid growth, we have a tremendous opportunity for Airships to become a hub for commercial space flights. This would showcase Scotland's already world-renowned skills in engineering and science, propelling us into developing the next generation of space-related industries. And in Scotland, we already have 18% of all space-related jobs. Some of the largest global aerospace companies are already at Prestwick, including BAE Systems, GE Caledonian, UTC Aerospace Systems, Roadwood International Inc., and as John Scott indicated, Spirit Aerosystems, which alone employs around 1,000 at Prestwick. Scotland's achievable share of the global space market is £4 billion by 2030, and Presswick will be vital to this, offering the UK's first horizontal launch facility, low-cost regular access to space, and providing full services to the sector. Not only the space industry will profit, we'll have more spending power in the Ayrshire economy, from spaceport workers and increased tourism, bringing further benefits. Ayrshire already has huge appeal because of our beautiful coastlines, golf courses and rich heritage. The spaceport will build on that. Prestec is one of only two Tier 1 UK airports able to take aircraft in the case of security emergencies, as well as being a search and rescue base for HM Coast Guard. A further advantage to its, uh, is its proximity to two hospitals within 20 minutes' drive. In Glasgow, home to some of our nation's finest university graduates, research teams, innovative companies, and over half of Scotland's aerospace workforce, is within an hour of Prestwick, along with 8,000 engineering undergraduates. Central road and rail services make it simple for equipment and materials to be transported and to attract specialist staff. So thanks to this SNP government, there has been over 150 million invested in Ayrshire's further and higher education infrastructure over the last five years, and 62 million pounds in support from the Scottish and UK governments through the Ayrshire growth deal was agreed just last Friday, along with 18 million pounds from South Ayrshire Council to support the space and aerospace industries of Presswick. Presiding officer, Prestwick has been a centre of aerospace excellence for over 80 years, and today it continues to go from strength to strength. Prestwick space. And I'm afraid there you must conclude. No, you Scotland's must conclude. Strength conclude. In conclude. And engineering. Conclude. I'm uh, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. You make an ageist comment to the chair. You can't expect me to be sympathetic. Sit down, please. Uh, I now call Daniel Johnson to be followed by Gail Ross. Presiding officer, I was going to begin by glibly uh, uh, calling you Rocket Lady, but I think that would, uh, uh, I wouldn't dare do that. Uh, but I think it's an important debate. I think it's an important debate for a number of different reasons. First of all, this is clearly an opportunity for the Scottish economy and one that we need to grasp. But more importantly, I think that it is one which I think as the government motion rightly identifies, builds on the, the strengths that we have in Scotland. I think, as Scots, we are sometimes 
too slow to uh, recognise the strengths uh, that we have, and I think it's important that we identify them. But perhaps most importantly, I believe that this is an opportunity for us to talk about the cool stuff that we've seen on recent visits in and around our constituencies. So let me begin by doing just that. And that, I, I was hugely uh, excited to look at the NASA robot Valkyrie that's based at the informatics department at Edinburgh University. It's a 1.8 meter humanoid uh, uh, robot uh, that has been donated, gifted by the Johnson Space Center to the University of Edinburgh so that they can help them develop the control systems um, and uh, other technology required to develop this robot. A robot that has been built to look at how robots can be used uh, in space exploration. So robots in space, it doesn't really get much better than that, although I do have to admit that when I come home from work at the end of a day like that and describe what I've done, my wife does ask me whether I have a real job. But I think it is hugely important that we look at, at these things. And I think if, if a number of years ago people had talked to me about spaceports, I would have thought that they were talking about Moss Eisley rather than somewhere here in Scotland, although I would not dare describe either Shetland or indeed Sutherland as a hive of scum and villainy, even if that's how Obi-Wan Kenobi might have described such a place. But I think that, but the, uh, no, I won't embroil myself in that particular space war, but I think the very fact that Scotland does build more satellites than anywhere else in Europe, or indeed outside California, is remarkable. And I think the way that the space uh, industry has changed in terms of the entrepreneurialism and the real opportunities, perhaps most conspicuously by people like uh, Elon Musk and SpaceX, and the fact that we can take advantage of those opportunities here in Scotland, I think is hugely exciting because Scotland is truly a centre of excellence for technology and engineering. And indeed, I was very pleased that the Minister highlighted uh, the activity that's taking place in Edinburgh in my constituency in the Royal Observatory because there we have the Higgs Centre for Innovation in the UK Astronomy, uh, Astronomy Technology Centre very much at the forefront of the development and investment in SME development in, in terms of space opportunities um, and, and in particular I think the recent uh, funding for SPRINT uh, which is the National Space Sector Catapult Centre uh, to Edinburgh University, which just occurred in August 2018, is hugely um, uh, welcome, uh, really enabling uh, us to draw down on the many important factors that we have here in Edinburgh, data science being one of them, but also in terms of the data infrastructure and the opportunities presented through the city deal. Uh, we also have a number of other things uh, uh, occurring uh, in Edinburgh University, such as the orbital microsystems uh, uh, and, and so on. But I think more broadly, uh, I think that we do need to look at how technology is going to change our industry and the nature of employment. I think the space sector is just one of those opportunities and it's vitally important that we focus on the investment and support that that's required to take advantage of those opportunities. My one final comment is in this is that in these days it's almost impossible to ignore Brexit, but I think the true cost of Brexit is the distraction that it is from the real focus, which should be opportunities such as this, so we can develop our economy for the future and make sure that Scotland is at the forefront both of technology and also developing jobs for the future. Thank you. Thank you. I call Gail Ross to be followed by Dean Lockhart. Ms Ross, please. Thank you, President Officer. Can I also thank you for allowing me to leave um, right after my speech as I have other business to attend to and apologies for those whose speeches I won't be able to enjoy. Um, as the MSP for Caithness, Sutherland and Ross, it's no surprise that I am able to support one site for a spaceport. A few years ago, someone who shall remain nameless uh, whispered to me at the end of a meeting in Caithness, what do you think about launching rockets from North Sutherland? And at that time, I must admit, it did seem like a bit of an impossibility, because what on earth could this little piece of the Highlands possibly offer the multi-billion pound space industry? How could we ever get this off the ground? Move forward to 2018, and I find myself on Good Morning Scotland, explaining how a remote peninsula in North Sutherland could become the first vertical launch site in Europe. The grant award from the UK Space Agency of two and a half mil million pound, along with 9.8 million from HIE, giving a total of 17.3 million to one of the most remote, rural and fragile areas in Scotland. And that's not with the private investment of Lockheed Martin and Orbex. 
Sutherland is one of the areas set to be hit by the closure of the Dunry nuclear power plant, which is the single biggest employer on the north coast. And it's predicted that its population will fall by at least 11.9% by 2041. It is imperative that we do all we can to create opportunities to keep young people and families in the area. In this and in many more regards, the announcement of the Space Agency grant funding, along with HIE and Lockheed Martin and Orbex, is backing for the Sutherland site, is brilliant news for my constituents and wider Scotland. With the rundown of Dunry, this will provide confidence to my area that other industries will and can move into the area and offset the impact that the closure of Dunry will have, and especially on those people who want to remain and work there. The Caithness and North Sutherland Regeneration Partnership is recognised as a great way of working. It's been supported from its inception by the Scottish Government, and I feel it's now time for us as a Scottish Parliament to show that we're looking to support the area as a whole. Following the award of the grant last summer, Highlands and Islands Enterprise is developing the proposed spaceport at Sutherland, which could create 40 jobs for the local community and hundreds more in the wider supply chain. Orbex have already announced plans for their base in Murray. There are also opportunities for Inverness, the Western Isles, Argyll and Butte, and Shetland has also signed an agreement to establish a satellite tracking and communication centre in Unst. And I was happy to hear the local member, Tavish Scott, confirm that this is indeed going ahead apace. And it just goes to prove that by working together as Team Scotland, we can see rewards for all of these areas. Our proposal will give the opportunity to grow, for people to grow their skills within the sector. Businesses in the supply chain will benefit and it will attract tourists who will bring their hard-earned cash to spend, enabling more small and medium-sized enterprises to flourish. Presiding officer, the UK government is working at pace to develop the detailed regulations to implement the Space Industry Act 2018 and HIE continue to support a range of organisations interested in es establishing space launch services. So in conclusion, presiding officer, this project is an absolute lifeline for my constituency in one of the most remote, rural, economically fragile and demographically challenged parts of Scotland. We must get behind it and show North Sutherland that they are not forgotten and to show the world that this little piece of the Highlands is indeed open for business. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Dean Lockhart, who followed by Stuart Stevenson. Mr Lockhart, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to contribute to this important debate on a significant and fast-growing sector of Scotland's economy, although I'm a bit disappointed that all the good quotations on space have already been used by other members. We've heard, we've heard that the space sector offers the prospect of high-value jobs and a boost to the Scottish economy. The sector has grown at an average of more than 8% every year over the past decade, and average wages in the sector are four times the national average. But over and above this, the space sector will deliver much wider advantages in the fields of transportation, energy, the environment, information technology, and industrial productivity. And the good news is that Scotland is uniquely positioned to lead the UK's commercial space sector and become one of the leading pioneers in Europe. And we welcome the fact that both the UK and the Scottish Government recognise this potential. As the UK astronaut Tim Peake said after his voyage in 2015, we need to give our industry a chance to develop. If we're not involved now, then we're simply going to miss the boat. And responding to this challenge, the UK government's industrial strategy has set the ambitious target to increase the UK's share of the global space market from 6.5% now to 10% in the next two, uh, 10 years. The UK industrial strategy is also positioning spaceports across the country to access the global market for launching small satellites worth £10 billion. And Scotland is benefiting significantly as a result of these investments. As we've heard, 18% of UK employment in the space industry is in Scotland. Last year, the UK government announced over £31 million of funding for the UK space sector, which includes, as we heard earlier, uh, support for the Sutherland space uh, port, creating hundreds of new jobs and considerable economic benefits. Initial funding of £2.5 million has already been allocated to develop the vertical launch site in Sutherland, and this is going to use innovative ro rocket technologies to pave the way for a world-leading space flight facility. Commenting on these investments, Lockheed Martin has highlighted 
that the UK space agency's strategic vision for a world-class launch market will position the, na uh, the nation for a very bright future. In addition to these investments, the UK government working together with the Scottish government through the Ayrshire Growth Deal has committed to developing Presswick Airport as a horizontal takeoff space, space port and a new aerospace and space innovation centre as part of a sector leading cluster. As John Scott said, this investment will bring about a transformational change to the future of Ayrshire's economy and that's something that quite rightly has uh, cross-party support in the chamber. Another crucial area in which the UK industrial strategy is delivering is in the field of satellite technology, which has recently received investment of over £50 million. This is already a, an area in which Scotland leads. We've heard that Glasgow companies produce eight satellites every week, and these firms have welcomed this new investment in Scotland. Commenting on the future of the space satellite industry, Clyde Space has highlighted that having a spaceport located in Scotland will bring about a whole host of commercial advantages and not only to the satellite operations in Glasgow, but to the entire space sector uh, across the UK. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, the space sector offers a significant opportunity for Scotland to develop and lead in a vital industry for the future. And the best way of doing this will be through close collaboration with industry and research partners across the UK. The UK industrial strategy provides the scale, the expertise and unparalleled levels of research and development which can help Scotland reach our full potential in this area. And I would encourage the Minister and his colleagues, uh, and perhaps he can mention this in his uh, closing speech, to fully realise these opportunities, work together with the UK Government and take advantage of the scale that the UK industrial strategy will provide. And I uh, support the amendment in Edward Mountain's name. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Colin Beattie. And Mr Beattie will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Stevenson. Uh, for this debate, I think two obvious questions uh, come to mind. Uh, first, why Scotland? And second, why space? And the answers are really quite obvious. Why Scotland? Well, we have a long tradition of engineering and uh, invention. Many of the technologies that we use today are possible because of that history. David Stewart uh, referred to James Watt, who uh, introduced uh, the steam engine uh, to our industries. John Logie Baird invented the television. Indeed, he demonstrated the first colour television in the late 1920s, uh, uh, after, not long after uh, the first uh, black and white television. And we also had from uh, Ken Gibson uh, reference to Montgomery Scott of Star Trek. Uh, but he failed to uh, provide the quotation uh, that the actor James Doohan, who played uh, Scotty, uh, when asked by the director of the, the, the film what nationality he thought this engineer should be, the actor simply replied, all the world's best engineers have been Scottish. And that's why Star Trek had a Scottish engineer. So why Scotland? Well, Scotland continues to punch above its weight. We all know that. Uh, we've referred to many of the companies in the west of Scotland. Uh, Spire have been blown away by the first-class uh, employees they can attract in Scotland, and that's why Glasgow is the European uh, headquarters. Now, why space? Well, uh, space uh, represents an infinite possibility or near infinite possibility. In financial terms, we've heard of the value of the industry now and the expectations that uh, it will triple in the lifetime of many people who are here today. Um, capturing just a little bit of that cake would be extremely valuable to us in economy, growth, in well-paid jobs, and indeed in developing new technologies and owning the intellectual property here to provide enduring uh, income streams. And the public sector has its role in providing the consents and the infrastructure, both at UK and Scottish levels. But of course, there's a bit more to it than simply that. Space uh, has softer power that we need to recognize. Sputnik 1 uh, went up on the 4th of October, uh, 1957 as a demonstration of Soviet power and Sputnik 2 with the first uh, mammal Laika a dog on board went up precisely to align with the 50th anniversary of the Russian Revolution uh, in what was then in the old calendar the October 
1917. It actually went up on the 3rd of November uh, 1957. So it is a matter of soft power as well as hard power. But we need to look beyond ourselves and look at what we can be rather than what we are. I, I simply love what's on the side of the Taj Mahal uh, where Shah Jahan's uh, quotation is, happy are those who dream dreams and are prepared to make the sacrifice to make them come true. Well, we have dreams for space, but we have the means, not needing great sacrifice, uh, to make them uh, come true. Um, I think uh, Tavish Scott uh, made a very important point. He said, we should be first. And space illustrates that. Who was the second woman in space? The answer is uh, Kondakova. We remember Valentina Tereshkova was first, but second, we don't remember. Who was the second American to orbit the Earth? We remember John Glenn, who was the first, but Gus Grissom, we may not. And who was the second Soviet? He was Titov Gagarin, of course, we remember, presiding officer. Thank you very much. I call Colin Beattie. Then we move to the closing speeches. Mr. Beattie. Presiding officer, I'm of an age to have been brought up hearing the immortal words in my ears, beam me up, Scotty. Space may be our final frontier, but the galaxy is no longer far, far away. Scotland's the opportunity to be a leader in the ongoing reach for space, and we can become a significant force in the context of space advancement and industry for years to come. Scotland's already begun the push to develop itself as a leader in the reach for space. In a 2016 London Economics report entitled Development of the Scottish Space Industry, it states that it's imperative to first consolidate and maintain the strong existing base of the Scottish space industry and economy in order for Scotland to become a market leading space cluster, a strategic focus on one capability, market or infrastructure needs to be identified and all development effort needs to be focused on establishing Scotland as a global authority and centre for that activity. Scotland's key to the development of the UK space market, the report went on. The UK Space Innovation and Growth Action Plan from 2010 defines a target for the UK space economy to capture 10% of the global market by 2030. Scotland may be regarded as a location-based space cluster supported by a range of institutions, policy measures and other infrastructure characteristics backing the industry by means of a range of activities including network and industry coordination, business incubation, technology funding, business and industry promotion and research and education activities. There are some countries in Scotland who are already reaching into space and recently I had the opportunity to visit Sky Aurora's new production facility in my own constituency of Midlothian North and Musselburgh in Mlone Head and Skyrora is an Edinburgh-based launch vehicle company which leverages proven space technology to provide a cost-effective and reliable launch service for satellites from northern Scotland, in line with the UK government's aims to capture a larger share of the global space market. Attracted by proximity to future launch sites and customers, as well as the ability to gain access to the universities and benefit from the long-standing engineering heritage that our country boasts, Skyrora opened their first production facility, Scottish production facility in Lone Head, evidence that they're already adding value to our economy and their statement is that we aim to develop the Scottish space ecosystem to reduce the cost of access to space, allowing all of society to reap the benefits that space data can provide, ranging across every sector imaginable. Now Skyrora successfully launched Scotland's first ever commercial rocket last August 2018 and plans to uh, launch a further three test vehicles within the next year, building up to their first orbital launch in the early 2020s. And they have no doubt that Scotland is the ideal place to conduct such activity as they push forward with their plans to solidify their position as the UK's most advanced satellite launch vehicle company. And this focus, space Focus company is investing in Scotland and choosing to invest in space will have diverse long lasting positive effects on the Scottish economy. The London Economics report stated that Scotland's space industry is significant and it leads the line globally in the nascent field of nanosatellites. The close proximity to launch facility will make the logistics of launch significantly easier. This will reduce the need to piggyback off larger satellites launched into geostationary orbit. And according to Skyrora, Scotland builds 40% of the world's smallest satellites and 25% of, sat of the world's telecom satellites but it lacks the capacity to launch these into space. 
Scotland has the opportunity to be a leader in the ongoing industrialization of space. And as we invest in local resources, our economy will be strengthened and will become a powerful force in the context of space advancement and industry for years to come. So let us make the choice of continuing to invest in the development of our space sector. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, closing speeches, Colin Tavi Scott goes for Liberal Democrats. Mr Scott. Please. Thank you very much. I think the real message of this debate, uh, presiding officer, is for Kenny Gibson not to insult the presiding officer in future, so as to continue his, uh, uh, to make sure he can finish his entire speech, which we were all uh, uh, gleefully waiting for there. And since we're doing history, the 21st of July this uh, summer will be the 50th anniversary of Neil Armstrong uh, walking, on the, uh, walking on the moon. Uh, and uh, I took my family some years back to uh, Houston on holiday uh, for reasons I will not bore you with, um, or to do with, fa to do with friends in the southwest of the United States. Uh, and the, the host family took us to Mission Control in, uh, in, in Houston. And uh, I don't know if others have been to it, but it is well worth uh, a visit. It is, it is, of course, space history, uh, but it, boy, does it bring back uh, and bring back uh, uh, some memories of watching those things when some of us were uh, rather uh, uh, younger and smaller uh, than we are uh, now. Just uh, three points I want to stress in, in uh, uh, reflecting on the um, contributions that have been made this afternoon, presiding officer. Uh, the first, and Stuart Stevenson mentioned it, is that Scotland does need to be first. I, uh, I, I don't apologise for making this point. Uh, my concern is not so much what goes on in Scotland. My concern is the competition that exists across uh, Europe. The amount of money that, for example, the Portuguese may uh, pour into the Azores. They're also trying to catch Orbex. They're, uh, they're also uh, working hard with the... Uh, uh, with some of the other companies that have been mentioned in this uh, debate, we are not the only ones here who aspire to provide the, uh, s to provide the services and indeed the locations that uh, the launching companies uh, need. And on the satellite companies, I think a number of members have made uh, eminently sensible observations about the scale of that industry, the spin-outs from universities, the excitement that that uh, creates, the, the benefits particularly uh, for the teaching of STEM subjects in schools and the excitement that that, uh, the, uh, or, or rather the excitement that creates in physics and chemistry departments where teachers can now see uh, a way in which you make real uh, why uh, young people, young girls and boys would take um, uh, physics and chemistry um, courses in our high schools. Uh, space can do all those things. It's, it so reaches some of those uh, points. But to make it even stronger, we've got to make sure that we do um, win this business, uh, win the launch business. I, I personally believe there'll be more than enough business for more than one launch site across Scotland. John Scott made a very persuasive case about uh, Prestwick and our people have certainly talked uh, uh, talked uh, to uh, many of the companies that uh, uh, he mentioned. The interesting thing about horizontal launch, and I agree with his analysis, of course, is that in order for horizontal launch to uh, drop the rocket safely from the underneath and the belly of the aircraft, it has to get into northern airspace in order to do that, where there is nothing that it can, where there is nothing that in, in simple terms it can drop it upon. And that is why the ground station in Shetland, the ground station that will exist in the Faroe Islands, I have no doubt there will also be, um, at, in time, ground stations fairly, uh, further around the, the north of the Arctic uh, uh, Circle uh, will all be part of that international uh, network. Because here's the thing, every time, and Stuart Stevenson's, I don't mean this in a derogatory sense, but Stuart Stevenson's rightly looking at his mobile phone at the moment. I'm told that every time you, but between getting up in the morning and getting to work for most of us every day, uh, we will have used 23 separate satellites. Now these are not, as the Minister rightly said, these are not Cape Canaveral satellites. These are things that are the size of the folder sitting on Mr Stevenson's uh, desk. Now an awful lot more of those are going to go up into space and we, Scotland not only designs and builds them, but in the future can undoubtedly launch them and can then recover them as well. The, uh, how am I doing? Briefly, yes, I'll give you a little extra time. Yeah. Um, does the member recognise that uh, becoming the space dustman also is a, a commercial opportunity? Yeah. So Scott. We could spend an, an afternoon on, the, on that as well. That's an entirely fair uh, point as well. So my plea just to the Minister to conclude, uh, presiding officer, is just that there should be uh, what I hope will be a level playing field, that all flowers can flourish, uh, that uh, Scotland does indeed build this great industry. I think there would be absolute cross-party support for that. But we're all allowed to get on without people people getting in our way and we make sure that the industry wherever it exists in Scotland both in academic terms but also in sheer commercial terms because the commercial markets the real bit that we want here uh, can benefit for the future of Scotland and that includes no matter where it is whether it's Sutherland uh, Unst, uh, in uh, Pennycook or where else uh, it needs to it needs to happen it needs to happen as quickly as we possibly can. Thank you very much. I call on Rhoda Grant, Cruise for Labour. Ms Grant please. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, this debate provided an opportunity for some 
light-hearted banter, it would appear we're all Trekkies now. Um, but it, did, uh, it is a serious debate. We have to look at the advancements in technology um, that have made talking about spaceports um, possible. It's absolutely incredible that this has happened. And we need to make sure we're ready for them. I think Tavish was talking about using mobile phones. I was telling my mother last night um, what we're going to be debating today. And she said, why? And I said, you use your phone. And she does. So she's going to benefit from this too. I was slightly disappointed that the Scottish Government said um, that their ambition was for one sport, spaceport in Scotland. As we've heard through the debate, there are two kinds of spaceport we could have, uh, vertical and horizontal um, launch pads. And I would like to see the Scottish Government being a bit more ambitious to make sure that we have at least two. Minister? Yeah, I, th I think perhaps I, I wasn't clear enough, but the Scottish Government is keen to encourage anyone coming forward with a spaceport proposal, um, and that will be considered by the agencies and supported on its merits, and that goes for uh, vertical spaceports and horizontal spaceports, and we are keen to have as many spaceports as we can sustain in Scotland. Rhoda Grant. And that was a welcome intervention. Um, we need to make sure in the Parliament that we unite to ensure that this prize comes to Scotland and we need to be careful about wasting too much energy fighting with each other for where the spaceport will be based. As a Highlands and Islands MSP, I know all the potential spaceports in my region would bring a great economic boost and it's very much needed in those areas and I'm sure that's true for the whole of Scotland and John Scott and Kenny Gibson among others made strong pleas for Prestwick and Ayrshire. And that's why the Lib Dem amendment is uh, important because it, what it actually does is look to provide assistance to all the areas who are looking to develop sp spaceports. And this will make sure that these developments come to Scotland, but it also allows all areas interested to benefit in some way from this and develop centres of excellence for themselves. Because it's not only the jobs at the launch site, but the jobs in manufacturing and central services um, and having a spaceport in Scotland would help encourage all areas of Scotland and then, and, uh, to welcome the industry to set up shop there. So I think it could provide a number of centres of excellence. Mm. David Stewart told us that in Scotland we design and build and operate spacecraft, but at the moment we have nowhere to launch them. So this is a very, very important step that we need to take to make sure that we fit the bill for all aspects of, of this industry. The very nature of the work means that developers are looking at rural areas, and I'm sure this was the case when space travel first began. The fear that something could go wrong and therefore launching out to sea means that there's less chance of damage if something does go wrong, um, rather than risk a satellite falling onto ground in a built-up area. But I'm sure that very quickly these concerns will be overcome. But in the meantime, I'm happy to have an industry that's looking at rural areas. And this was strangely true of Dunry as well. It was built away from centres of population and rumour was that the plan was to roll the reactor into the sea when we were finished with it. So it's maybe fitting that the Sutherland spaceport is developing, is developed on the same north coast as Dunray was. And there was a point made by Gail Ross that uh, with the downturn of Dunray, having the spaceport in Sutherland would be a much needed boost to that area as it would be for others, I'm sure. We also need to look at the skills and knowledge we have and to encourage young people to take up STEM subjects and look at uh, the technology and robotics uh, that we need to develop this industry. And David Stewart said that this space innovation is actually attracting young people into STEM subjects, and, and I hope that's very much the case. And Daniel Johnston talked about the University of Edinburgh and the very interesting things they're doing with space robotics. And again, I think that emphasises that this is just not for one area of Scotland, regardless of whether you are beside the spaceport or not. There is work there that we can develop. And just because of our proximity within the country, I think we can all make the most of it. Um, the minister in his opening speech talked about um, some of the things that we could develop as part of that, things like solar energy in space and access to minerals in space. I would 
just a voice a note of caution to close. We need to be very careful how we exploit space. We need to make sure that we don't wreak havoc there. Some of that havoc we have wrecked on Earth, we have to be much more uh, gentle with our interventions in space. Thank you very much. And I call on Gordon Lidhurst to close the Conservatives. Mr Lindhurst, please. <clears throat> Deputy Presiding Officer, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. These are, of course, the words of President John F. Kennedy as he attempted to persuade the American people about the Apollo program. It captured the public's imagination, not only on that side of the Atlantic, but also around the world. Putting a man on the moon did once embody what we thought of as a space project. However, as we've heard today, it has become about much more than that. With the data coming from satellites that we send into space and use here in the chamber, including Stuart Stevenson on our mobile phones. Now, Scotland is uniquely positioned to make the most of this because, as JFK's quote states, it organizes the best of our energies and skills. In preparing for today's debate, it has been quite eye opening to understand the extent of Scotland's readiness to embark on this mis mission. And indeed, I think the minister himself in his opening speech, uh, Colin Beatty and others throughout the debate have commented on this. Now, this is not only in terms of the geographical advantage that we hold for horizontal and vertical launch to reach highly sought after orbits. I think that's um, technical language, certainly not uh, language that I'm familiar with myself. Leaders in the sector, including Nick Allain of Spire Global Designs, have been quoted this afternoon saying that Scotland's access to manufacturing and engineering expertise, as well as its world-class universities, has been the attraction for businesses setting up in Scotland, meaning that Scotland now manufactures more satellites than anywhere out with the United States, and Glasgow is building more than any other European city. That Scotland punches above its weight is evidenced by the fact that, as we have heard, our proportion of jobs in the UK space industry is double that of our proportion of the UK population as a whole. Now, we've heard this afternoon about the importance of the west and the north of Scotland in our space sector. However, I would also take this opportunity to comment on the growing role played in this very city of Edinburgh. The space economy relates not just to the traditional view, as I've indicated, of the space sector in terms of manufacture launch and operation of space assets such as satellites, but also the use of signals and data supplied back to Earth from these assets, including for Earth observation imagery. Edinburgh's place as part of the space economy, in spite of the fact I don't think it was mentioned in, by my colleague Edward Mountain in his opening speech, um, is an important one. For example, the International Centre for Earth Data was set up last year jointly by a team from the University of Edinburgh and satellite technology provider Orbital Microsystems. It will use data to improve forecasting of weather across the world, uh, use in a number of sectors including ag agriculture, aviation and shipping. Edinburgh is ideally placed to make the most of this opportunity taking advantage of its excellence in data science and geoscience that can maximize the, de <coughs> pardon me, the derived value from Earth observation satellite data using the latest data techniques. That reputation will only grow as Edinburgh's city deal, utilizing funding from both the United Kingdom and Scottish governments, aims to train through Edinburgh and Harriet Watt universities 100,000 data scientists and foster 400 data-enabled startup companies in the next 15 years. And as organizations and public bodies understand the usefulness of this data in areas which range from the monitoring of crop yields to pollution. We have made it clear on these benches that the potential for Scotland is to lead the UK's commercial space sector. Given the ambition that the UK government has in this area, it is an exciting prospect for Scotland. 
The Scottish Conservative amendment to today's motion welcomes both the Space Industry Act 2018 and the investment of £50 million by the UK government to support small-scale satellite launches and suborbital flights from UK spaceports, both of which arise from the ambition contained within the UK government's industrial strategy, which is intended to increase the UK's share of the global space market to 10% by 2030. And as we've heard, the Space Industry Act lays the foundations to allow commercial operators to launch vehicles and payloads into orbit from UK soil. This was swiftly followed by the announcement that Sutherland was selected by the UK Space Agency to be the first spaceport in the United Kingdom, and indeed in Europe, backed up by two and a half million pounds of UK government funding, bringing about 400 jobs to the region by 2023 uh, as a result of these launch activities and attracting further investment and talent to the area. The spaceport will, of course, be utilised to launch into orbit the small satellites that are rapidly being manufactured in Scotland. Both the manufacturing and launching of that hardware, we have heard, could be worth £3.8 billion to the UK economy. And with the downstream use of data taking place in cities such as Edinburgh, Scotland has real end-to-end, -end, or I think the meaning of that phrase, that may just be youth speak, uh, beginning to end capability, which includes the design, the manufacture, the launch, the operation and utilization of the data all taking place here in Scotland. Deputy Presiding Officer, in summing up the future prospects for Scotland's space industry, I will round up by quoting another American president, Richard Nixon, who said, the sky is no longer the limit. Now, having said that, Having said that, <laughs> budgets are limited and we will not be supporting Tavish Scott's um, amendment for the Liberal Democrats as it provides no explanation of costing or what is intended from the enterprise zones that I think he's quite interested in himself. So I close with that remark, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you. I wasn't quite sure when JFK's quote began and ended, but I don't think he said I'm not being supporting Tavish Scott's amendment. I'm sure that's not the point. Now, can I, can, I call, can I call Ivan McKee, please, to close for the government minister, please, till decision time. Thank you, um, President Officer. Um, it's been a pleasure to take part in the debate this afternoon, um, a debate that featured three Scots, um, not just Do John and Tavish, but also, of course, uh, Montgomery. Um, and um, I think it's clear from the debate today that everybody um, that took part was very serious about uh, our ambitions for Scotland's space sector and it's been um, uh, running through a few of the, a few of the, the comments that were, uh, that were raised. Daniel Johnson and uh, Gordon Linhurst talking about the great strengths that Edinburgh brings to the party, not putting in a, a bid for a, um, a, a launch site like many others were, but talking about the, the data science strengths that I think when we run this forward over the coming decades, the people that are working on data science are probably those that are going to get the biggest financial benefit from the, uh, the space sector in coming, coming decades. Um, John Scott and Kenny Gibson talked about Ayrshire and Presswick and clearly the Scottish Government very keen to, to support that and I was intrigued by uh, Kenny Gibson's time machine, although we didn't get to hear the, uh, the uh, taking them back to the Bay Horse in 19, whenever it was, of course. John Scott. Thank you for taking the intervention, Minister, and you speak of big data, and would you like to speak a little bit about the additionality of the Ayrshire Growth Deal and the data um, centre that will come, that was announced in the Ayrshire Growth Deal, and how that will also benefit and make press another reason for it being the location of choice? Minister? Yeah, the, um, the, the Ayrshire uh, Deal, as John Scott mentioned, will support the creation of the Aerospace and Space Innovation Centre, which will be a central hub to support uh, growth and Support and encourage growth, support and aerospace and space businesses uh, in the area, and I think that will contribute significantly to the uh, to Ayrshire in the, in this uh, in this sector. Um, Dean Lockhart mentioned the UK industrial strategy, and I just like to make it clear that uh, every opportunity I encourage businesses, universities, and others uh, across all sectors to. Um, uh, make, uh, make bids into the industrial strategy funds um, to make sure that Scotland gets at least 
our fair share of the money that's available um, to develop uh, the various sectors in, uh, in Scotland. Um, I think it's worth talking about uh, a point that uh, Claire Adamson raised, and I'd like to thank her for uh, explicitly not putting in a bid for a spaceport, which was, uh, was very welcome. But I think the, uh, the fact that she's talked about space debris and the opportunities there opens up another, uh, another area, and this was also touched on by Rhoda Grant. Um, it's important that we respect the environmental aspects of this, be that in space debris, be that in the design uh, operation and, and uh, the types of fuel used in uh, launch vehicles. Um, but those also uh, generate opportunities for uh, commercial development as well, as, uh, as Claire Adamson uh, highlighted. Um, I think one of the very important issues that came up in the, uh, the debate was uh, round about uh, inspiration. David Stewart and Rora Grant both talked about this, how we leverage um, space, the romance of space, to inspire young people to get involved in STEM careers. This morning I was at um, a, event, a data fest event with a primary engineer, the City of Glasgow College, um, and the Data Lab Innovation Centre in Glasgow. And that was uh, a number of primary schools were there talking about what they were using, uh, putting, uh, putting forward some um, uh, competitions. Mr McKee, they were please just forward stop there. for a moment, just sit down. Now, it's getting loud again. I say this every time. It's not fair to members who've been in the debate, nor is it to the Minister, for you to chat. Minister, please, let's hear what the Minister has to say and the members who were in the debate who are interested. If you're not interested, just sit there and be quiet. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Um, so a number of primary schools were there to present in a competition about how they were using data. It was very impressive the, the way the young people were using spreadsheets and analysing data. Um, but clearly, and I made the point to them, um, one of the big future uses of data will be space. And I think I'd encourage the industry um, to proactively go uh, raise its profile in, in schools and encourage uh, young people to get involved in studying STEM and in STEM careers um, using the, the hook of, uh, of the space industry as, a, as an attraction. I'd like to talk briefly about the enterprise zones uh, raised by Tavish Scott and in the Lib Dem amendment. As I said in my opening statement, I think that uh, enterprise zones are certainly something that we're, we're looking at, but I don't want to commit at this stage because the Scottish Enterprise Review is underway and this will be con considered in the round to see what the evidence says in terms of where, uh, where those are best deployed, uh, where and in, the, in which sectors. Um, so certainly true to say I've been struck by the energy and enthusiasm of everyone involved uh, in the sector, across public, private sectors, and in the chamber this afternoon, with everyone showing willingness to take innovative approaches to new challenges. It's important to remember that we've already got over 7,500 people employed in Scotland's space sector. We're already the largest producer of small satellites in Europe, as a number of members have mentioned. Um, and it's also true to say we probably know more about what's happening in space at the moment than we do about what's happening on planet Brexit, but that's another, another story. Um, these are real achievements, creating jobs and real wealth for Scotland. We'll build on our existing strengths to deliver full end-to-end -end space sector capability um, in build, launch and operation. We'll encourage investment in the sector to realise its full potential for Scotland. We're already attracting world-leading companies to all parts of Scotland. And we want it to be clear that Scotland is not just involved in the space sector, but as a global leader in that sector. Our ambition, as the First Minister has clearly said, is for Scotland to be seen as an inventor and a producer, not just a consumer of goods and, in this case, space services. And this is perhaps true nowhere more than in the fast-growing space sector. We aim to capture, um, as a number of members have said, £4 billion of space-related business in Scotland by 2030. And with the size of that prize that's in our reach, it's not surprising that there is fierce competition as we witnessed this afternoon uh, with members clearly passionate in Adri. So, Daniel Johnson. I thank the Minister for giving way. I wonder if you might reflect on the need to focus on consolidation. We've seen flurries of activity like this in the past where there's been spin-outs from academic work only to see that evaporate, such as the computer industry in the 1980s. I was just wondering if that's a point that, that should be addressed in the strategy on, on, the, on the issues he was raising just there. Minister Ivan McKee. 
I think it's an important point. Uh, as any sector evolves and develops, you have a flurry of activity at the start. I think it's not the place of government to say who the, who the winners and losers are going to be. Um, that will happen through a process of merger, et cetera, and development. And I think um, it's hugely encouraged that there are so many startups. And I think we'll watch that process closely to see it evolves. But at the moment, we're at early stages. And uh, the more businesses that, that start up with great ideas, the better. And that's to be, that's to be encouraged. Um, so I think we're already seeing economic benefits flowing from developments in the, in the space sector. The Orbex rocket factory in Forres has been mentioned. I've visited that factory myself. Colin Beatty um, has mentioned Skyrora and their new rocket facility in Lone Head, Scotland now with two um, uh, rocket manufacturers based here. The major investments at Presswick that we've mentioned with ambitions for the first horizontal launch facility and the Aerospace and Space Innovation Centre. Shetland Space Centre's plans for satellite tracking facilities and, of course, for vertical launch facilities. The Western Isles, aspirations for vertical launch. Macrahanish, we've spoken about as well. The small uh, satellite manufacturing cluster that's going from strength to strength in Glasgow. The space data applications businesses in Edinburgh, but also across the country, and there are no doubt many, many others. Uh, our enterprise agencies are ready, willing to support viable business proposals. The Scottish Government, working with the Industry Leadership Council, is looking at what else we can do to further support the sector, including, as I mentioned, the review of enterprise zones. And our ambition is to have at least one spaceport within Scotland, with the growing market for launching small satellites expected to grow to 2,000 by 2030. There could indeed be scope for many more. We need to ensure that Team Scotland prevails with public and private sectors working together to deliver our ambitions for the sector. And what a great ambition it is to have a fully integrated space sector, building satellites, building rockets, launching satellites, gathering and using that data from those satellites. Scotland may be a small nation, but we're open, agile and flexible. We're already punching above our weight globally and in a rapidly growing global space industry, now is the time for us to step up, seize the opportunity to make Scotland Europe's leading space nation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on building on Scotland's strengths in technology and engineering to become Europe's leading space nation. Um, the next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau Motion 16365 on approval of an SSI. Could I ask Graeme Day on behalf of the Bureau to move the motion? Moved, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. Uh, that question will be put at decision time to which we are about to come, but I believe Mr Brown may wish to ask a point of order. Keith Brown. Thank you, President. Oh. Right. Yes, Keith Brown. We'll see you in a second. There you go. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I wish to raise a point of order on what I believe was a false statement made by James Kelly today at First Minister's Questions, when he stated that the budget agreed recently by this Parliament has resulted, among other alleged results, in the ending of support for the Citizens Advice Bureau in Clipmanager. President Officer, I am aware and have confirmed that Clipmanager Council have provided exactly the same funding as part of this year's budget as they did last year. I'm also aware that the leader of Club Manager Council has written to James Kelly confirming these facts. And I'm also aware that the manager of Citizens Advice Bureau Club Manager has written to the council thanking them for their support. There can be, Presiding Officer, only two possible explanations for this statement from James Kelly. The first is that in researching the position in relation to his statement, he's followed the same contempt for the actual facts that both he and his party leader and his party have demonstrated at every budget with no facts, no proposals, no effort and no credibility. <laughs> And the second is that James Kelly, and the second is that James Kelly made this statement in full knowledge of the actual facts, oh. merely, oh. merely in order to scare voters in my constituency, many of whom will vote in a fortnight in a council by-election. That can only be the can be the only explanation for previous statements made by James Kelly and indeed by Richard Leonard asserting that the council proposed to close two schools, two schools which, presiding officer, remain open. I'd be grateful for your ruling, presiding officer, and would respectfully request that James Kelly is given the opportunity to correct the record in the same public forum that he made his false statement, this chamber, and I believe he should confirm which of the two explanations caused him to make the statement, offer an unreserved apology for having got his facts so spectacularly wrong, 
and an apology to those of my constituents that he had needlessly made apprehensive by his deplorable statement that the vital and excellent services provided by Club Manager Council's Citizens Advice Bureau might be jeopardised. It would appear for mere party political advantage. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Brown. I can also thank you for giving me advance notice uh, that you intended to raise a point of order. Uh, I'm sure Mr Kelly will uh, be aware of the remarks you have made, and uh, Mr Kelly will be aware, as all members here will be aware, that if uh, anybody believes a statement is inaccurate, that a mechanism does exist to correct the record. We're going to move on now to decision time. And there are uh, five questions today. The first question is that Amendment 16312.2 in the name of Edward Mountain, which seeks to amend uh, Motion 16312 in the name of Ivan McKee on building on Scotland's strengths in technology and engineering to become Europe's leading space nation, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 16312.2 in the name of Edward Mountain is yes, 79, no, 21. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is that amendment 16312.3 in the name of David Stewart, which seeks to amend motion 16312 in the name of Ivan McKee, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that amendment 16312.1 in the name of Tavish Scott, who seeks to amend the motion in the name of Ivan McKee be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 16312.1 in the name of Tavish Scott is yes, 19, no, 81. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that motion 16312 in the name of Ivan McKee as amended on building on Scotland's strengths in technology and engineering to become Europe's leading space nation be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 16312 in the name of Ivan McKee as amended is yes, 79, no, 21. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. And the final question is that motion 16365 in the name of Graham Day on approval of an SSI be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting. <laughs>